ready when you are. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, so my my name is uh, Sukumar uh, Sukumar Dore Raj, and um, I, I want to talk about uh, the best mid mid range laptop or tablet in the market today. Um, any of you looking for a laptop or tablet right now? Okay. Good. Uh, how many of you have MacBooks? Five. Okay. And uh, what about Windows machines? Okay. That looks like a majority of you. So, um, yeah, let's take a look. Um, this is the agenda for today. So we're going to look at uh, the industry overview. Uh, we're going to look at, um, I want to focus on three uh, specific machines. Um, Surface Pro 4, uh, the Galaxy uh, Tab Pro, and the um, iPad Pro. Uh, they were both, all three of them were uh, uh, released uh, in the last six months or so. So I think uh, you're gonna find value in uh, what we go over. So, um, according to Gartner studies, um, PC uh, shipments continue to decline, um, and this has been going on for the last five years or so. Uh, you're probably aware. Um, a lot of the big, big names are HP, Dell, Lenovo, Apple, and they all know that. Um, and they're trying to adapt to the changes. And um, uh, tablets um, were introduced about five, six years ago uh, with the iPad, right? And tablet sh shipments are also on a de decline. Um, iPads. Uh, sales and uh, Galaxy sales are on the, on the decline. And so uh, there's a new category that's trending right now, which is uh, basically tablet uh, laptop hybrids. They're, they're considered two in one convertibles, or they, they call them uh, detachable devices. Um, according to IDC, um, Microsoft is projected to lead the market. And so I, I decided to uh, do a case study on Surface Pro uh, 4, which is uh, uh, manufactured by Microsoft, and how it compares to the iPad Pro and, and the Galaxy Tab Pro. And uh, here's a graphical view of the um, uh, market share for the, for the uh, PC industry right now. As you can see, the big players, HP, Dell, Apple, uh, Acer, and Microsoft is actually in the uh, 31% others uh, grouping. So what makes uh, Surface Pro 4 special? And uh, you actually see a picture of the Surface Pro 4 over there. It's a 13 inch uh, tablet looking uh, uh, laptop hybrid. Um, it has a kickstand on the back and um, you could attach a keyboard to it and use it just like a laptop. And it also comes with a, a stylus uh, pen, so you can you know, uh, write on directly on the laptop uh, on OneNote or other apps uh, that, uh, that lets you draw or uh, write on. The, uh, the, the tablet is, uh, is versatile um, because, um, because of the many ports on, on that machine. So there, there's a USB port uh, right on it, so you can attach a mouse to it. Um, uh, you can attach an external hard drive to it. Uh, uh, and also, um, it has a mini display uh, port on it, and you can you know, uh, display it to a monitor. The performance, so it has a range of uh, CPUs, um, starting with the M core processor all the way to the Intel i7 processor, so the performance is uh, very good on these machines. And I already talked about the connectivity ports. And uh, the, the other thing is, it runs the full um, uh, Windows 10 OS version, so for, for, for most of us that uh, use Windows, uh, Windows machines at work, you can bring the same work to home and continue working on those projects at home. And the form factor, so it's not bulky like laptops, and um, uh, you know, uh, and you get the uh, tablet factor because you know you can you can have, you know it's portable. You can take it anywhere, work on work on it as uh, as you would on regular tablets. 
Uh, the resolution is beautiful. Um, it's, it's one of the best. And it is enterprise friendly because it uses the same Windows uh, operating systems on it. And it's, uh, it, it's uh, in, in the tablet mode, it's, it's really beautiful to uh, uh, read on the machine. And here's a, a, a simple comparison between the Surface Pro 4 and the iPad Pro. So they're both very similar machines. They're both, the, the dimensions are the same. And um, they cost approximately the same, except uh, there are a few uh, key differences. Uh, one is that the Surface Pro 4 uh, does use a powerful CPUs. Uh, it can go up to i7s. So the A9X processor that the iPad Pro uses uh, is uh, essentially a, a tablet type of a processor. It is a high performance processor, it just can't do uh, 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 other powerful um, operations. Um, the other key difference is that the number of ports on it. So you can't connect a mouse to the um, iPad without a net, another adapter. Um, you can't connect an external hard drive and so on. Um, <laughs> and also, uh, um, uh, Surface Pro uh, 10 uh, runs the full uh, Windows 10 uh, OS. And here's another graphical view of the differences. As you can see, um, and, and the, the other thing is a lot of us use the productivity apps at work, right? So we use Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and they continue to uh, work much better on the Windows machines rather than your Apple devices. Um, the one area of concern is battery life. So iPad Pro, that, uh, iPad, iPad Pro's battery does last a little bit longer than um, Surface Pro's uh, battery, but um, Microsoft uh, is likely working on that. So the other uh, device, Galaxy Tab Pro, um, is actually also a Windows 10 uh, hybrid device. Um, the, the only difference is that Surface Pro uh, 4 does have uh, more ports uh, on the device uh, than the Galaxy Tab Pro. Um, another piece of information I, I forgot to mention was that uh, the Surface Pro 4 has a micro SD uh, slot, so you can add storage to the device also. And uh, the resolution is better on the Surface, better build quality. On the surface, uh, it's made of uh, magnesium as opposed to uh, plastic and magnesium on the yachts. I know you work at Samsung. Um, performance is better uh, because of the processors used in the surface. Uh, the surface pen is included with the uh, Surface Pro 4. Uh, you, you, you would have to buy a, an additional uh, pen for the Galaxy. And there, there is that kickstand on the surface. And um, the Surface Pro uh, is the clear winner out of those three devices. And uh, just because it's business ready, it's consumer friendly, it's versatile, and uh, gives you the best bang for the buck. Uh, the challenges are the competitors, obviously. So everyone, everyone knows this is, this is where the market's going. This is what everybody wants. And, uh, so all your big boys are working on the same, same type of devices and they're going to continue making better devices. And uh, yeah, other consumer trends, you know, we might like different types of devices going forward. That's always changing, right? So that's the challenge. And the dependency on the success of Windows 10. Um, Windows 10 has been uh, free up to this point for uh, upgrades. So we don't know how successful it's going to be beyond that. And uh, rising supply costs of, of the materials uh, on the device. And that's it. You guys have any questions, comments? All right, great work. Uh, comments for Sukumar? Yeah. So I think uh, the bridge issue was, was really well. Uh, you use a lot of the methodology to discuss a lot of good transitions. Uh, and it followed your original agenda trend. I think you probably, uh, the challenges slide seems a little misplaced. I think the slide right before it seems like the solid continuity kind of help. So other than that, we'll... Thank you. Right, other comments? Renew? Uh, just 
I just noticed the um, on the graph, he didn't have the axes, uh, what it represented. I saw it was like 1 to 10, but I wasn't sure exactly what that was. Yeah, the name is Yeah. Yes, yes. I was thinking about that when you mentioned uh, uh, hours, the battery life. It's like, what is, yeah, so what is that? Is that the rating? It's a uh, rating I made up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, in this case, I might suggest that using the take method to present this graph, just thinking about how you would practice it, may make you realize, oh, when I explain the title, explain the axes, it's going to be unclear, so maybe I should use a different metric. And also, when you actually <laughs> present it using that method, could have been helpful for us, too. Get other comments? I would Jim. say try to make your uh, movements more purposeful. I, I know you kind of got into a habit of like swaying back and forth or taking a few steps, but uh, if you can use your movements to accentuate this on the slides, I think you did that when you were finishing up a little bit, but uh, oh, okay. at the beginning uh, especially it seemed like you needed a little bit of direction. Okay. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, good point. Movements could have accented the material more. Um, a couple comments I had. I was a little, I felt like you did a great job gaining our interest when you said, is anyone in the market for a laptop computer? And I'm thinking like, oh, I'm going to get some valuable information about what I should buy. And then it felt a little bit more like you're uh, talking from the company point of view, like the company's challenges and revenue and, and, and that sort of thing. And I didn't feel like you had that clear, I'm going to give you this valuable information throughout your entire presentation. So I feel like you've lost us a little bit that way. And some things that might have helped you with that clarity, one is if you had like a custom header footer, like why is the, you know, why is this particular pat, I, why is this particular product the best for you, or challenges for this company. Yeah. A custom header footer to remind us where you were, because as I was sitting down, I was just kind of rustling, and then I, I heard you say, you're going to give us this information about from a consumer standpoint, or it seemed like that, and then I got a little lost, and I was looking for a header footer to guide me to that. Also, a tracker would have helped with this. So I'm going to tell you why this is the best product, and I'm going to take through three comparisons, and then I'm going to tell you the challenges for the company. may have made that conclusion clearer. Uh, let's talk really quickly about this slide. How do we like this slide? I think a lot of speeds and feeds, it's not really, there's too much data. Yeah, there's too much data. The only, the only saving grace is this, is there's so much we didn't even bother to look at it, right? Um, but you used it to try to make a point, and we just listened to you, so it, it kind of worked out, but I don't think it supported you in your effort. Um, good, 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 good. And then lastly, the fast ending. Like you just, you came up right up on the ending. Remember what we talked about, if you tell your audience that you're about to end, intention and focus increases, and that's a prime time to say, this is the important conclusion that I want you to take away. All right, great work. That's what bicep is broken. Bicep is broken. Now another thing we could do, we could turn the lights down if anyone so desires. Just give me a heads up on that. That's so funny that the next thing is about sleep deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> you want to turn the lights off? Yes, Ruthie. I'm going to do that, so the project Okay, okay. Do you, want the, you like the lights the way they are, Al? Um, I think maybe turning them down might be a little bit. Down, yeah, all right. Let's take a look at that. Spread it. <laughs> okay, I think I know what happened. There was a delayed reaction. All right, I'll 
as I take it. Alright, sorry. Why don't you go ahead and get started, and okay. maybe I'll do some distraction <laughs> stuff while you're talking. Um, just the next part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're hel yeah, holding it there. Oh, the right. Yeah, there you go. Right. Okay. Yeah. Forward to the right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alex Tosano. My presentation today is on sleep deprivation. Uh, more specifically, I'll be explaining what sleep deprivation is. I'll be reviewing some of the symptoms and detrimental side effects of sleep deprivation. And I think more importantly, I'll be explaining what some solutions and remedies could be for all of us to make sure that we do not fall victim of sleep deprivation. Um, being that we're all MBA students here, we're all here to develop our skills and learn uh, new ways to develop our talents so that we were more productive in our um, work area. I think that ensuring that we do not fall victim to sleep deprivation and we have good energy is something of particular importance that we can all benefit from. So the agenda for today, I'll be reviewing some interesting facts about sleep deprivation. I'll be explaining some of the symptoms you can look out for. I'll be explaining also some causes for sleep deprivation. I'll be reviewing what some of the detrimental side effects could be from not sleeping enough. And I'll be discussing some solutions and providing some takeaways that everyone can um, use going forward. And lastly, I'll take some questions. So facts, so we, I guess before I begin with facts, sleep <laughs> deprivation is simply the state of not getting enough sleep. Uh, this may not sound scary at first, um, since I guess there's many nights where we do not sleep. Uh, the recommended amount for adults um, is seven, uh, seven plus hours. But as you will see, uh, not sleeping enough can lead to very serious consequences, uh, which can inhibit our performance. So 50 to 70 million Americans have chronic sleep disorder. This is equal to about one in three Americans, so we see that this is very widespread. About 40% of Americans report accidentally falling asleep at least once a month. And this is at work or just in the ordinary course of their daily lives. And if you are in a situation where you need to be vigilant, we can see where this could be very dangerous. Um, sleep deprivation is widespread. It affects everyone. Some particular groups that are at higher risk are men, um, people that are 50 years and under, uh, minorities, lower income, and singles have also seen to show increased uh, rates of sleep deprivation. Um, $41 billion was spent on sleeping aids. This includes uh, medications such as Ambien, Lunesta, and Belsomra, which again proves how widespread this can be. And it, can, it also can lead to someone to believe that if you may not think you have sleep deprivation if you fall in, and you don't fall into that category, um, you might, I guess, be mistaken. Um, lastly, $13.6 billion was spent on morning coffee. This is a stimulant that people take uh, to com combat some of the symptoms of sleep deprivation. Um, some more interesting facts. About $18 billion was, was lost in productivity in 2015 due to sleep deprivation. This is uh, people I guess not going into work or performing as they should be or making mistakes. Um, and some, some of the um, more notable disasters that we've seen have been a cause of sleep deprivation. Um, here we see Exxon, the Exxon Valdez oil spill case, uh, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and the Challenger explosion. In these cases, people were responsible for being vigilant and uh, they failed to do so because of the lack of sleep deprivation. Um, and this bottom chart here, uh, two interesting facts that I would like to point out. We see that over 40,000 car injuries um, were the result of sleep deprivation in 2015, and over 1,500 cases of fatalities occurred uh, from car accidents in 2015 due to sleep deprivation. Um, in this chart, I've um, indicated the trend in the amount of sleep the average American gets. If we look in 1942, the orange line of nine hours or more and the top line of eight hours or more, when we sum those up, it was about 60% of Americans were getting 80, eight hours or more of sleep. And through the course of time, coming to 2013, 
you see that these numbers have dropped, and now about half or 30% of average Americans get eight hours of sleep or more. Um, looking at the five hour or less line, in 1942, this was less than 5%. And as of 2015, we're almost up to 15% of Americans get five or less hours of sleep. Um, simplifying the data and putting this into two categories of six hours or less or seven hours or more using the same trend, we can more easily see how um, the average American sleep has decreased over time. Um, and lastly, in this bar chart, we look at the average hours of sleep by um, age group. So if you pay attention to the two groups, 18 to 29 and 30 to 49 on the left, we see that these two air, um, groups have sleep a lot less when we compare it to the older groups um, to the right. So again, this kind of um, helps you to see kind of where you may fall and try to keep like an open perspective as to um, whether or not you may be suffering from sleep deprivation. Uh, so now that we've seen some of the um, facts and some of the widespreadness of sleep, sleep, depri sleep deprivation, we can go into some of the symptoms to see if maybe this would <coughs> relate to this a little bit more. So obviously the biggest symptom is sleepiness, fatigue, and lack, of <coughs> lack of motivation, irritability. Um, Obviously, when we don't sleep, we don't have good energy throughout the day. Sleep is important for our recovery, and without that, we can feel sluggish. So this is one way of um, seeing if we may be victim of sleep deprivation. Anxiety and depression, these are two things that are linked as well to sleep deprivation. Some of the, sign the symptoms are similar. Body aches, again, this goes back to not recovering um, as quickly when we don't sleep. Um, changes in physical appearance, another sign. Um, and now I guess we can get into more of the causation, some of the reasons why we can be um, not sleeping enough. So I guess the number one reason from the research is stress. So worrying a lot about various things, overworking, physical stress, things that keep us up at night. That's the main cause from what we've seen from the studies. Irregular work hours or sleep patterns, being that we live in a global world now, we have various shifts throughout the day, we have to stay connected. Um, this has led to the rise in sleep deprivation, not getting the inadequate daily sleep pattern. Um, behavioral reasons, this is more of your lifestyle. If you choose to go out or take stimulants, etc., this will, can cause um, a change in your sleep patterns. Sickness and medical conditions, obviously, um, if we fall victim to certain illnesses, it can inhibit us from sleeping at night. Um, and technology, so being up uh, late at night using gadgets, looking at bright screens, keeping things next to our bed can also uh, prevent us from having a good night's sleep. Um, so now we can move on to speak to the um, effects and complications that may occur. Um, and this chart right here sums up a lot of the things that we discussed about. Um, but sleep deprivation seems to promote mental decay. Um, and it, it lowers our cognitive functioning. So our attention, our reasoning, reaction time, decision making, <coughs> long term and short term memory, coordination and creativity is all hurt by sleep deprivation. As mentioned earlier, being that we're all MBA students and we're trying to be uh, the, more, the more productive we can be in our work area, we can see how sleep deprivation can inhibit us regardless of our skills and talents. Um, damages to social interactions, uh, again, sleep deprivation affects our mood <coughs> and energy. You may not want to particularly engage when we're feeling low energy or when we're in a bad mood, which can affect our networking skills or our uh, team and collaboration efforts at work or in daily lives. Um, low energy we touched upon. Um, it also seems to damage our immune system and our ability to recover, which can um, cause us to be sick and again, miss work or uh, fall into other areas that uh, 
negatively affect their well-being. Um, and it and also contributes to several health issues. So type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure are two things that are linked to sleep deprivation. Uh, so now, solutions. <coughs> um, so st since stress is the <laughs> utmost um, common uh, cause for sleep deprivation, learning how to manage stress is of um, ultimate importance here. And so is time management. So um, they say that time management equals life management and in terms of stress management. So understanding what keeps you up at night, understanding how to manage your schedule better will help you to get more time in your day and to relax and to sleep better at night. Eating healthy and exercising regularly, this um, goes hand in hand with uh, making sure that we don't fall into some of the illnesses that we see, uh, which can lead us into not sleeping well at night. Um, creating a healthy sleep pattern, so this is related to your circadian rhythm. Um, our body tends to want to sleep and eat at the same time every day. Um, so fostering a good sleep pattern will help us get enough sleep um, throughout time. Avoiding <coughs> stimulants. So, um, again, sometimes people drink caffeine, um, they might drink alcohol uh, uh, during some weeknights or at night. This can uh, help us from not sleeping well at night as well. Um, and then trying all natural remedies. So some of the things that I found in my research um, when doing uh, this presentation, um, using like, like warm milk, uh, chamomile tea, Things of that nature, just uh, zoning out can help with um, making sure we get better sleep. And then this goes hand in hand with um, the all natural remedies. Practicing meditation and yoga seems to be um, very useful as well. Um, so to conclude, sleep deprivation is a real problem. It has dangerous side effects and as we saw, it's very widespread. Um, it's important to recognize these symptoms and to uh, make an effort to eliminate sleep deprivation whenever possible. Again, this will promote our well-being and our productivity at work. Um, we can try some of the remedies that I just explained, um, such as avoiding stimulants, practicing yoga and meditation, uh, exercising, eating healthy, etc. Um, and it and it would be a good idea to set a game to set up a game plan if you think that you're suffering from sleep deprivation, and for you to monitor your process. Um, and monitor your state of improved well-being to keep you on track to ensuring that um, you stay on course. And nowadays they have Fitbits and all types of gadgets that you can use to monitor, to monitor your sleep. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Good, excellent, Alex. Um, so I think the lights came out because yeah. There, there's the motion sensor thing. Oh. So, that's, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. You didn't necessarily need to be moving, but it was. It did remind me that, oh, it's because you haven't moved the whole time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you walk around a little bit, then the oh, motion okay. sensors will hit you. Um, I don't necessarily think you needed to move during this presentation, but one thing I did notice is that you're standing here most of the time <laughs> looking back and forth at the slide. And he spent a lot of time looking at the slide this way and talking to the slide this way. Did anyone notice that? Now, this, I also noticed that this was a drastic improvement from your presentation last week where you're off in the corner. This being here in open body language, a little more powerful, we took it more seriously. To take it to the next level, do you remember the, uh, the turn, touch, talk method we talked about last week? Yeah, okay. Does anyone remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Turn, touch, talk. So, you're either clicking to the next slide, you're turning and looking at the slide, or you're talking. And you're not doing both at the same time. You're not turning and looking at the slide and talking at the same time. So this is one of those extreme examples where I would say do that, and that will help. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a lot. There was a lot in this presentation. There were a lot of facts, there was a lot of solutions, there were a lot of causes. And I feel like because there was so much, it got lost. There were a couple of really interesting things that I wanted to hear more about. Uh, the disasters. The challenge. Anyone know the Challenger disaster was caused by sleep deprivation? Or the uh, 
What else do you Chernobyl. Chernobyl. I didn't know that either. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so Evan wants to hear evidence. Like, prove it. <laughs> I, I, I've studied that actually pretty extensively. Okay. Yeah, it, was, it was involved. It was, it was the night shift guys. So. Wait, it was what? It was the night shift that was on. That was, that was really nice stuff that okay. Um, yeah, so I wanted to hear about that. I think that was a chance to really draw us in that this is important. You may have thought that a lot of information is what you needed to draw us in. Uh -huh. And that, that has power. And it, and it could have had power, but I think it would have been more effective with a few Wow, look at this Chernobyl, look at this uh, uh, Challenger example, and think about how this relates to you. Okay. Okay, the only other thing I want to mention is this first graph. Now, these graphs, let's look at these graphs. Did anyone understand, follow this while he was presenting it? You did? What's your name? Daniel. Daniel, all right, so you, you followed this while, while he was presenting it? Yeah. Right, can you explain it to us? <clears throat> bottom is the, is the timeline. It looks like back in the early 40s, a lot of people got um, uh, nine hours or more. I kind of just looked at the beginning and the end. Right, a lot of people, oh, so it's this nine, oh, so nine hours of the 40s. I, mean, I was trying to change the color scheme, and with the version of PowerPoint, I, I couldn't so, figure out So, okay, so it's nine hours or more, so this one, okay, so the number of nine hours or more, all right. It's so a lot of data. Yeah. I think trying to be compiled into one graph. So it's like, uh, yeah. what, 15% of people in 1942 got nine hours or more. 25% of the people got seven hours or more in 1942. It's just like. Yeah. yeah. With yeah. the next slide, I kind of. But the, yeah, it was yeah, a little bit there, I kind of. Yeah, that made it easier. Wow, OK. So we've got this converging thing going on. Even this one, I would have explained the use of the take method. All right, average American sleep trend. Tell me the axes, and then tell me the key takeaway with this converging okay. thing. And then visually, we see the converge, and we say, oh, that means something significant. Okay, okay. great work. Thank you. Thank you. Spanish 
is going to continue to become more important in the United States. Now I want to look at Spanish as compared to other languages um, in the country. Here's a graph that I made of the number of people who speak a language other than English in, in the United States. This could be their primary language or their secondary language. Um, but Spanish, we have uh, 37 million right now. Uh, this number is you know, way more um, than all of the other Indo-European languages combined that you might hear spoken in the United States and all of the other Asian and Pacific island languages. Okay, so that's why uh, Spanish is uh, significant in our population. Uh, but is it worth it to learn? Yes. Uh, so we're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about the learning process here. Uh, Spanish is easy to learn, so that's a plus. It closely resembles the English language, making it easier to learn. And it rarely deviates um, from the rules of language. So the Foreign Services Institute lists Spanish um, as a category one language in terms of difficulty of learning. Um, this is out of four categories, category one being the easiest to learn. And uh, it takes about 575 to 600 hours um, to learn in total. If you treat it like a part-time job, you're going to learn Spanish in less than 30 weeks. Uh, it closely resembles English because of the uh, Latin root words that the languages both share. They have a lot of shared cognates. What a shared cognate is, is a word that is essentially the same, with the same meaning in both languages. A uh, quick story about this, um, one time I was trying to speak to uh, a Spanish speaker about a toy robot that I had when I was little, and um, I, there was a toy robot in the room, and I was pointing at it, and I was saying robot, and they did not understand what I was saying, until five minutes later when he goes, oh, robot, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, if I had just tried to uh, pronounce it in the Spanish way, you would have uh, gotten a lot farther, a lot easier. Uh, it is also a similar alphabet and sentence structure uh, to English, well, unlike some other languages where it's very, very complicated. Uh, it really deviates from the rules. Um, pronunciation rules in Spanish uh, don't change. You learn how to pronounce a letter. That letter is pronounced the same way uh, no matter what except for diphthongs, which is a very small exception, and it's worth it. And um, one of the reasons why it rarely deviates from the rules is uh, Spanish has this academy, the Real Academia Española, uh, the main one being in Spain, um, where they actually set the rules of Spanish. If there's any questions about how the language, um, you know, any questions about the language at all, they, they set the rules, so uh, there's an answer, you know? <laughs> that's nice, there's no, uh, no question. Uh, so that's, that's um, you know, why it's easy to learn. And there's some benefits that go along with learning Spanish also. One of them is the travel benefits, uh, which are great by themselves. Uh, this map shows all the countries that Spanish is either their official language or a co-official language. The red stands for official language, that's the only language there. The blue is a co-official language. Uh, there's 21 countries on this map uh, colored in, but there's 26 countries, including the United States, that have a significant Spanish-speaking population. Uh, these are just the ones with the official language. And a quick note about New Mexico, I learned um, is that New Mexico actually has its laws written in both Spanish and English, so they are able to uh, count that as a co-official language for their state government. Um, so some further benefits of Spanish are the cultural benefits, uh, you know, the main one being travel, which I just spoke to. Another one um, is food. Uh, can you just imagine all the worlds of food that are opened up to you now that you can travel to all these great countries that speak Spanish? Uh, and literature, you know, you can, uh, you can 
encounter new worlds, you speak, uh, you read about um, you know, Mar Mario Vargas Llosa, the Allende, and the languages that they wrote in. It's a poetic and sexy language. Um, and also literature is a good way to learn Spanish. Um, you know, partly one of the best ways to reinforce um, what, what you're learning to get good at your, your own pace. And you see what is uh, correct, you know, you're not guessing and uh, potentially learning the wrong thing. Uh, so that's the second set of benefits of Spanish. And the next set of benefits that I want to talk to you about are the benefits that affect you specifically as a Rutgers business student. Um, there are business applications to learning Spanish, uh, one of which is you can connect uh, with your clients better. You have 400 million native Spanish speakers throughout the world, right? You want to be able to connect to them on a level that they're comfortable in. Even if they speak English, you can speak it to them in a language that makes them feel comfortable, makes them feel at home, you know, make better connections that way. Uh, with people that are uh, in, you know, knowing that you can communicate in Spanish. Most of, ha over half the world is multilingual. More than half the world speaks more than one language. And that allows you to make those connections. Um, and while uh, more than half the world speaks more than one language, only a quarter of Americans speak more than one language. So that puts you at an instant benefit, right? You can compete. Um, you can stand out from the crowd, you can be a better uh, business person. And um, so I just took you from, you know, what, why Spanish is significant in the world, why it's significant in the United States, and, um, you know, told you that it's very easy to learn, um, and it has great benefits to you, both in travel, cultural benefits, and in your personal lives as a business person. And so in conclusion, I just want to state that learning Spanish as a second language is crucial to your lives as a records business student and beyond after you graduate. Sometimes it felt like more of an informational type of presentation. And I feel like just really being clear about this and saying, I think you should learn Spanish because it will enrich your life. Now, as a business Rutgers student, or as a Rutgers student, and your life forever. And I feel like that through line could have engaged us and engaged you a little bit more. Because I thought that was what you were talking about, but there were some points where it just, I, I didn't know why you were going off on this tangent, um, so, but I feel like some clarity around that would have helped you throughout your presentation. Any other comments for me? Yes, Adam. I just think she did a really uh, great job acting or um, being comfortable up in front of the group. Mm -hmm. um, like to be that comfortable up there. And, yeah. and throwing in like a little story or anecdote was nice, a nice break from the facts of Yes, fantastic. Uh, thank you.
very heavy topic. Sorry I had a scratchy throat. I went and washed my hands um, knowing that everybody else is going to have to touch this. So, um, who's a baseball fan? Just a couple of people. Okay, so if, um, if you live in this area, really anywhere in this area, you ought to be able to um, pick up a Mets broadcast and see one of the best young pitchers in baseball, if not the best um, pitcher in baseball right now, uh, Noah Syndergaard. So, uh, after competing for the Rookie of the Year last year, he's really gotten himself off to a great start. He's just 23 years old and he's only been pitching for a very short time frame, right? So who is Noah Syndergaard? Well, he's 23, he's six foot six, he's 240 pounds, and he's just got a rifle for an arm. So for baseball, right, you throw it hard, throw it fast. He was born in uh, Mansfield, Texas, to two athletic parents where he spent his whole childhood, right? He was drafted by the um, Toronto Blue Jays uh, back in 2010, made his debut about one year ago, and has quickly earned the nickname of Thor, mostly for his long golden locks. So, um, early life of Nova Syndergaard, high school, college career. Um, he started as a pitcher in high school in his junior year. Um, he was a good pitcher, but not a great pitcher. He grew six inches and put on 40 pounds between his junior and senior year, turning him into the six foot six guy he is now. And he was much improved in his senior year, garnishing some attention. He got enough attention um, that he was uh, courted by several colleges, but only one gave him a scholarship, and that was um, uh, Dallas Baptist University, uh, which was good for him and it was close. But very um, soon after he got the scholarship, something more exciting happened for Noah. So he was the 900th best prospect out there for high school students, but the Blue Jays picked him 38th overall in the draft that year. They saw something in him. The Blue Jays picking him meant that he had to forego college. Um, the uh, rookie draft occurs tonight, this year. So the rookie draft occurs shortly after college is out, but before they um, start reporting for the next year. So. Noah got an opportunity to go into the um, minors and start his early career. So as a professional, he played in the Blue Jays organization for about two years, um, mostly in Vancouver, where he was um, paired up with two other really good rookie pitchers. They were known as the Vancouver Three, and at that time, Vancouver would um, dress him up in um, mafia gear for promotional pictures. Um, he ended up getting traded to the Mets in 2012, the trade that sent R.A. Dickey and a couple of catchers up to Toronto. And he came down with a couple of other um, pitchers. None of the other pitchers anybody knows. <laughs> um, uh, no, it was clearly a standout from the group. Um, he made his Major League de debut, uh, like I said, about a year ago in um, May 12th. And he's been outstanding since then. So I'm going to um, take a break from Noah. Baseball is a sport about numbers and about statistics. And I'm going to tell you about um, three in particular. Earned run average is the number of runs a pitcher gives up over the course of nine innings. It's essentially a statistic that says, how many runs would you score against this pitcher had he pitched an entire game? Next most important for a pitcher is whip. It, it's walks and hits per inning pitch. It's essentially how many base runners does that pitcher allow on base per inning. Clearly, the more people you allow on base, the better opportunity there is for people to come home. So a low whip is very important. And the last being the strikeout to walk ratio. How many people are you striking out versus walking? With this being an indication of control, your ability to throw the ball where you're supposed to throw the ball and not be wild. So oftentimes, big strikeout pitchers are wild pitchers and walk lots of people. So back to Noah. Last year in his rookie season, like I said, he came in in May. Um, he had some pretty impressive numbers. He led all rookies in both whip and strikeout to walk ratios. He held the fourth best ERA of all rookie pitchers. And finally, he finished fourth in the National League Rookie of the Year um, competition. 
He was the highest of all rookie pitchers. If you like numbers, uh, very impressive numbers, including the 3.2 uh, for ERA. Uh, anything in the threes is considered good for major league pitchers. To be able to do this as a rookie is phenomenal. It, you only have to have one really bad game where you give up five runs and get pulled in the second inning to really destroy an ERA. So low ERA over the course of the season is a very difficult thing to do. So uh, how is he continuing? What's going on? Uh, well, they entered the postseason that uh, Mets did last year, one of their best seasons in a long time, in which he set a rookie record for strikeouts. So he struck out nine people in each of his three starts, and it was the, um, only the second time in Major League history that a rookie's been able to do that. He won the second game in the National League <clears throat> uh, Championship Series, uh, the only game he started in the series, and he won Game 3 of the World Series. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry. Um, he did well enough coming out of the season that the Mets um, had a promotional day lined up for him, in which Noah Syndergaard was able to have a garden gnome in his likeness. <laughs> so far this year, he is the, uh, the second best pitcher as far as strikeout to walk ratio at nine, only being beat by the ridiculous uh, Kershaw out in the Dodgers, who's got a, a ratio of 18. Um, third best in the league is four. He's got the third best ERA in baseball at 191. Again, only beaten by Kershaw and some guy out of the Cubs, uh, Arietta. And he's got the um, fourth, best, fourth best whip in baseball. So what I have here is a, a, a chart to indicate um, where some of the best pitchers are. So, so far this year, 156 pitchers have pitched enough or started enough games in order to qualify. The best third of them are displayed here on the um, screen. So these are the top 50 pitchers. The blue line going across the top represents the average earned run ratio of all starting pitchers in the majors right now. Uh, our left axis is ERA, right, earned run to average again, number of um, runs a pitcher gives up over a nine inning game. And you can see on our um, line here, that Noah is the best amongst the 11 gentlemen that are um, shown. Those 11 gentlemen are the um, pitchers that are under 25 years of age. The other 39 people that are on the line whose names I didn't put on there are all older than that. So of young pitchers, Noah Syndergaard is the best, and here are the gentlemen that are um, trying to catch him. So, so far, um, 2016 um, highlights. He continues to play. He gave up two run runs in six innings last night. He's throwing a 100 mile an hour fastball and occasionally hitting that 100 mile an hour fastball even at the end of the game. So his, his velocity is not trailing off. If you don't catch the beginning of the game and you see him in the fourth or fifth inning, he is still throwing the ball hard. He's also throwing the ball for strikes. He's a quick pitcher and he's throwing um, strikes. 71% strike ratio. He's the third best in the league. He throws the ball and challenges you to hit it. This year he developed a fourth pitch. He's now throwing a slider to left-handers to complement his curveball and changeup, making it more difficult to, to hit. And he's got six wins already this season. So ultimately, he has all the tools necessary, and as he's still developing by adding another pitch and throwing the ball hard, he's really going to be coming along, and he's fun to watch. I mean, he's on one of the best pitching staffs in baseball in, in the Mets, and he's a standout on that team. If it wasn't for Clayton Kershaw and Jake Garrietta, who are having two of the best seasons any pitchers have had in baseball, you'd hear a lot more about Noah Syndergaard. But just because he's in third place in stats behind these folks doesn't mean you shouldn't be paying attention. He's the best young pitcher in baseball. He's going to be around for the next several years, and he will soon be a household name. Thank you. Guys, the comments are good? Yes, so, uh, I, I think it might have been a good idea once you, uh, I'd like to break to, to describe what some of the jargon was, and maybe it could have been a few other things with them, but maybe you can pause to ask if anyone needs further clarification before we move on. Yeah, that would have been a good point. 
Good point. But also, great slide. So he stopped mm -hmm. to explain three key pieces of jargon, and then he explained what they meant and how that illustrated that this was one of the best young pitchers in baseball. James. As someone who finds baseball incredibly boring, I found that really captivating. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah great minute. I was going to say, um, I don't know if you noticed, but you only turn to look at your slides like twice. You almost knew everything, and now you're looking at them for reference, which is pretty incredible. Um, I like the tracker a lot. I think the only thing uh, was that final slide, when you, as you went to the conclusion, it had a paragraph, and I was focused on you the whole presentation, but I started reading that almost as soon as you went to it, and I kind of just lost you for a second. But overall, I just looked at the Yeah, great. He didn't look at the slides much. He was clearly an authority on this issue, and he found it interesting. So we found it a little, a little more interesting probably because of that, and we trusted him because he seemed like he knew what he was talking about. So we always want to be that much of an authority if we can. If it's something you're just getting familiar with, then be excited and passionate about it. If you can't choose something that you know as intimately as baseball. But this is an example of how when you're excited about it and you seem to know about it, we listen to you and we engage more. Any other comments? I'm a Brewers fan. <laughs> he, wiped, he wiped them out the second game of the season. <laughs> Only two runners could run that distance at that point of time. And this one guy who ran the modern Olympics was very 